first of all, I guess I'll say I, I'm surprised you're back, uh, but I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> if you weren't here last week, uh, I was pretty firm, um, and I, I, don't, I don't love doing that. I love to be a teacher instead, um, but I felt like it was needed, warranted to remind us of who we are. Today's going to be not total opposite, but, but total opposite. So um, last week, I started with a question, do you know the phrase people person? And, and some of you, you're like, yeah, that's me. Like, I love people genuinely care about people, want to be with people. It ignites me. It excites me. And you're people people, and the rest of us aren't. We just fake it. Like, we just do it because we're supposed to. We do it because we love you, uh, but we're not energized by being around other people. And so you, you've got this difference between personality of people who just naturally it oozes out of them, and for everybody else, it's a difficulty. But the thing that, that we can't sit back and say as a people is, well, I'm just not a people person. Well, that's fine with your own personality, but when you stepped into a relationship with Jesus and a relationship with other people called the church, you can't say I'm not a people person because God has made you and designed you to be a people person in a way that you care for, genuinely love and care for the good and the needs of other people. It doesn't have to be in front of other people. It doesn't have to be to a large group of people, but there has to be something inside of us that maybe not be innate and probably is not human, but spiritually gifted and nurtured and grown inside of us that over time in walking with Jesus, we see the things that he has done on our behalf. Our eyes are starting to open to the things and the ways he has carried us that we didn't know he was doing, that he was working on our behalf behind us and in front of us, that we too start to develop this type of genuine care and concern for other people, that we don't sit back and go, I'm just going to sit in my hole, hide in my room and be a hermit. That's not who he has made you to be. It's who you used to be humanly, but it is not who he has made you to be spiritually and supernaturally. And so I, th I think Paul kind of, I'd say pushing a little too far to say he knows this, but this is his hope and desire for the people of God as well. We said last week in Thessalonica, this is what he asked for, for the people of God. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, not just for one another, but for all as we do for you. And so as a church this year, not only focusing on discipleship, but we've been talking about our core beliefs, those things that define who we are and direct the decisions and ministry that we lead. That those things are what we fall to, what we base things on. It's all grounded in the cornerstone of Christ. And these values are based in what it looks like to be a believer, a, a disciple of Jesus. These aren't just cool phrases that you know, are, are pithy and you can remember and they kind of help you with a principle. These are actual building blocks of the Christian life. And so in the, in the fall, in the winter, in the spring, we went through the first four. We took a break in the summer, and then we came back last week and began our next core value called authentic relationships. And as I've done every time, for those who weren't here last week, I'll kind of catch you up in the sense that we have a statement or a phrase that helps remind us what this means. You can say authenticity, relationships, and, and not really have a common understanding of what that means. So for us at LifePoint, when we say authentic relationships, we mean that we are genuinely human and created for community. And that genuineness is important to us. We know that as people, we walk in no matter where we are, and we put on a front and a facade, and we don't like everybody to see what we're really feeling on the inside. And to a degree, that's okay, because I'll say, somebody needs to know your story, but not everybody needs to know your story, right? Um, and it doesn't have to be a counseling session every time you meet somebody in the, in the supermarket. You've seen those happen to the side, and you kind of steer clear, right? You go to the other aisle. But we are genuine. We are real. We open ourselves up about the hurts and the needs and struggles we have because we're human. We, we have those. We know we, it's not uncommon to us that we will have struggles. What you go through and what you face, there are thousands, if not millions of other people who go through and have gone through the same thing that you have. And so we are genuinely human. And we also know that God has made us to be in community with one another. And for the people people, that's easy. Like, you got that. But for the rest of us, it helps remind us, I can't stay in my hole. I can't stay back behind. I can't stay hidden. I have to step into community because I need it and somebody else needs it as well. 
And so the verse in the passage that we kind of hold on to for that is Paul to the church of Rome. He says, let love be genuine. Let you genuinely care for one another. He also says, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Again, love one another with brotherly affection. And then he does the one upper thing. He says, take it another step. Outdo one another in showing honor. That it's not good enough to say, okay, thank you, I appreciate that, but you... To, to outdo one another in showing honor, you have to be intentional, a word that we just used. You, you have to intentionally think about how can I do something to honor them, to respect them, to love them, to care for them. It has to be something that we think about. And again, it may not be natural for you. That's why Paul prays for it, that we would increase and abound and grow, that our eyes would turn outward. Last week, we used the phrase from Henry David Thoreau, maturity happens when your mirrors turn into windows. When you quit looking at yourself and you start looking at other people. When you quit focusing on your needs and you start focusing on the needs of those around you. That's what Paul's talking about, to outdo one another and showing honor to each other. So for us, this is why it's important. Again, anecdotal statement I used last week. You're not going to find it in scripture. You're probably not going to find it in a survey. And I don't know if anybody else would agree with me, but 30 years of ministry off and on, this is what I feel like. The number one reason people come to a church and stay at a church long time and long term is because of people, because of the connections and relationships they make. And so for us to understand that and to know that means that if people are walking into our doors or coming to our community group or to our events or even in the community, they, even if they're not a people person, they need relationship. They may only need it with one person, but they need it, a meaningful relationship with one person that knows them, that sees them, that understands them, that is there for them, to help them walk through the difficulties of life, to help them grow in their faith. And so I gave you the, the purpose of, of that idea of connecting with other people, and there's four parts to that. Last week, we talked about the first two. The first two were people and community. Today we're going to talk about care, and next week we're going to talk about discipleship. But this is a process. It starts with you can't have discipleship if you don't know other people or if other people don't know you. And so we talked about that idea that if we know that people come to a church and stay at a church, maybe they've had past church hurt, maybe they have current struggles, maybe they walk in and act like everything is fine, but they're falling apart on the inside, and they come for three months, six months, and nobody talks to them or gets to know them or sits by them or invites them to dinner or invites them to their house or invites them to their group, eventually they're going to go somewhere else a little more defeated and a little more unwilling to open themselves up to the next group of people. And so if, if we are people who are called to be like Christ, who Paul is praying for, that we would see other people and love other people, then we have to then turn our mirrors into windows, intentionally walking through these doors, walking anytime we gather together at an event, to community group, looking for ways to honor, to love, to care for, to speak to other people. That it can't be, what can I get out of this? It's what can I bring to this? It's not what can I take home with me, but what can I show up with to help that other person go home and feeling like our time together was a gift because I saw them, talked to them, and genuinely cared about them. And when we do, it invites other people to take another step. If you're not a people person, it is so difficult. You have like 95 barriers between you and the other person in front of you. They're invisible barriers, but they have to be removed and taken down. And it is partly our job as the other person to help remove those barriers through the things that we say, the way that we interact, the conversations we have, the follow-up that we have with them. Hey, it's so great to see you at this or see you at that. I'd love to grab coffee sometime. Hey, I remember you mentioned this about your mom. How's she doing? How's your mom and them? <laughs> if we do that, it invites them to take another step into that community of people where they're gonna find somebody that knows their story or shares their story somebody that has the same experience with them, or somebody that has a specific gifting that God can use in their life to help them through this state or this stage in life, which then leads us to the part I want to talk about today, that idea of genuinely caring for other people. And I mentioned it last week that, that we are good at the front door. And this has nothing to do with the guest services team. All of you who do that, amazing at that, amazing at that. We are really good at shaking hands, waving, and smiling. 
But I think an area we could get better at is when people walk into the door or walk into the room or walk into an event, that we walk across the room and say, I, I haven't talked to you before. I see you standing there by yourself. I, I don't know who you are. Can I know your name? Can we maybe go grab coffee or lunch? Or can I invite you to my group? That is that idea of intentionally looking for the other person and saying, I know you probably feel uncomfortable. I would say chances are you probably are hoping somebody comes to talk to you. That somebody might know your name, that maybe nobody took time to care about you enough to know your name and your story before. But in this place, we do and we are and we will. Because they have a story that they need to share. Because in isolation, the enemy defeats us, deflates us, discourages us, and causes us to walk away. But in community, it's much harder for that to occur. And you begin to feel comfortable enough to share your story. And sometimes, as I said, it just oozes out and you go, ooh, I didn't mean to say that. I hope they didn't catch that. But people who are intentional catch it because they're looking through the window saying, how can I help this person? How can I love this person? How can I care for this person? And look, it's not our job to fix people. We're not trying to fix people. We're trying to love them and bring them to the throne where Jesus can fix them because he's the only one. Because just seeing people won't change their lives. They have to see the gospel in action. But they can't see the gospel in action if we're not willing to walk across the hall, if we're not willing to walk across the room, if we're not willing to open ourselves up. And here's what happens. When you do, hearts are softened. And when hearts are softened, hearts are changed. And it's not always their heart. Oftentimes it's your heart that begins to soften and open up to caring for the needs of other people. Instead of looking at yourself and your own, you begin to genuinely care about other people. And when we do, guess what we do? We fulfill the law of Christ. John chapter 13, a new command I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are to love one another. All the law and prophets hang on this. He said, if you just do one thing, if you just do one thing, it would be to genuinely care for and love one another. And if you do that, that's enough. I want to show you a video. It's about two, three minutes long. He's British, so for some of you, you may have to listen intently, okay? It's this guy who, maybe where Wesley said my son was, just seeing all the fake, inauthentic, disingenuous people. And being like, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with church. I don't even want to have anything to do with God. And then as he was asked to take a step, people saw him and asked him to take a step. I want you to hear what happened in his life. If I'm honest, I never really liked the church. I didn't even really like Christians that much. I used to think of it like a package deal. Like, you get Jesus, and so you get the church and Christians thrown. It's just part of the package. And uh, there are some bits you like, Jesus, some bits you don't like so much, just like the church and Christians um, used to find that a bit annoying. But I'd turn up the church and go through it, but I didn't really enjoy going to church. And then one day, uh, I was at the back of our church in East London, and someone said to me, oh, we need help to run the coffee team and I was like I was like working like 70 80 hour week I'm like what and they were like yeah we Steve we really do help running the coffee team on a Sunday and I was thinking I'm a barrister I'm not a barista like I've got a job I don't need another job to run a coffee team but I just you know sometimes you, you just can't even think of what to say so I was like okay I'll do it I'll do it okay and and I instead I thought why did I do that so I turn up next week like, you know, trying to get the cups and everything get the coffee right as I handed these cups to people who something really changed in me. I found myself, as I handed coffee to these people, growing in love for them. I was like, these people are amazing. Like, this is this extraordinarily diverse community. It's been gathered from across the area, probably not another place that looks as diverse and integrated as this. This is a miracle. And then I, even people I found a little bit more frustrating and complicated, as I handed them their coffee, I kind of grew in love for them. And I kind of basically fell in love with the church. And then I kind of went back to the person who'd asked me to do it. I said, we need a new coffee machine. We need better beans. We need better mugs. Like, we, come on, these are amazing people. I want this to be the best coffee that they get. You know, they, they're coming to church on a Sunday morning. I got more and more passionate. I started to build a team to serve coffee on a Sunday morning. I sometimes say, making coffee changed my life. 
because I fell in love with the Church of Jesus Christ. I didn't realize why it was special. I didn't realize why it mattered. And as I made coffee for people, I suddenly realized, oh, the church is like the bride of Jesus Christ. It's like the thing he gave himself for. Like the church is God's plan for the salvation of the world. There's no plan B and God is going to build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So like God is putting all his eggs in the church basket. And I realized over those few weeks, there's a beautiful thing here. Yes, it messes up. Yes, it makes mistakes. You'll never find a perfect church, but it's a beautiful thing. And I thought, that's what I want to spend my life building. That's good stuff. Yeah, you can clap for that. That's, that's a life that was changed because he took a step, but he took a step because somebody saw him and somebody asked him to be involved, to be connected, to be engaged, to step into a role or a position that put him in front of other people and in community with the people that are serving on that team together that God began to open and change his heart as he saw people, as he began to genuinely care for people, their hearts and lives didn't change, but his did. And from hating the church to loving the bride of Christ, because he had a chance to interact with and engage with these people. He wasn't isolated anymore. He didn't see them as a messed up group of people. He saw them as a community of people chasing after Jesus with their mistakes and their mess ups and their struggles, but all in connection with one another of serving Christ and serving the body and his heart developed this desire and passion to be with them to serve them he was like no forget just the regular beans we've got to get good beans like we got to get the good stuff because they deserve it because I love these people it's not because I want to beat the, the local coffee shop in town it's because they deserve the best that I can give everything that I've got to work on my skill and my craft along with my desire and passion to meet them where they are so that they feel cared and loved for so that they know the love of Christ is coming through me into their life and they too would open their hearts to him and then turn around and do it for somebody else you see, the very same thing happened with Paul. I've talked about him so many times that he had a heart of stone toward the church. And then God began to open his heart to the point in Philippians chapter 2, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I may be cheered by news of you. He could care less about them before. But now he just wants to hear about him. He's just waiting for this letter to come back. I can't wait to hear about my friends and brothers and sisters and children in Christ that I have taught and raised up. I am sitting here eagerly waiting. For I have no one else to send you who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. When Paul came to meet Christians before, he was coming with a sword. And now he's coming with an open heart to say, I'm going to pour my life out to do everything I can to give to you for your good, your welfare. While I'm not being chained in prison, I want your good. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. And so you see what you just watched in video in real life, you see that happening in the life of Paul as he begins to love and care for the bride of Christ. As he walks with Jesus, he opens himself up more that his heart and life is changed and more and more people are evangelized with the gospel, not through preaching and teaching specifically, but genuine love and care in this man's life who everybody knew but was changed and transformed into this soft teddy bear that loved the bride of Christ. And you see him and Timothy just long and desire to be with the body and to be there for the body and be connected with the body and be in relationship with the body. It's why the writer of Hebrews writes what we take out of context in Hebrews chapter 10 and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting meeting together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the, all the more until the day draws Near. This has nothing to do with attendance. The writer of Hebrews is not wanting you to have perfect attendance and a sticker. 
The writer of Hebrew knows is that if you step into community, you have other people who are there to care for you and encourage you to take another step with Jesus so that you will be there to then help somebody else in their walk, in their faith, to take another step with Jesus as well. Because what we live in is a society of isolation that says, I can stay in my four walls, in my house, and I can live stream or I can podcast or I can audio book whatever pastor or teacher or preacher and I can get all my theology and I can worship with God all by myself you bet you can but Paul says while you have the freedom to worship Christ in isolation your life with Christ dictates that you lay down your preferences and your rights to be with and to serve the body that's why he tells the church in Galatia in chapter 5 you were called to freedom yes you have the freedom to do basically whatever you want to do only do not use freedom as an opportunity for the flesh But through love, serve one another. For again, like Christ says, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Your freedom wasn't meant to be used on yourself. Your giftings weren't meant for your own advancement. The resources God has given you was not to build up your own personal kingdom. The freedom Christ gave you was then to become a chain and chained in slavery to Christ to say what you do, I will do. What you have done, I'm willing to do as well. That you laid your life down for the good of other people, I'm willing to do the same thing even if I'm not a people person, even if it's hard for me, even if I don't like the people standing in front of me, I'm going to do it because that's what you've done for me and that's what you've called me to do and I know it's how you used me to spread the gospel and to open people's hearts, maybe my own heart to you. I'm going to share, as much as I stumped on your feet last week, I'm going to share some stories to, to encourage you this morning. I shared the story, uh, the message last week, and um, I talked about this idea that whether it's a friend group, whether it's a ministry team, whether it's a community group, I don't care what kind of group it is, what you call yourself. I, I struggle with groups who say it's, it's us for and no more. I, I, I grew up in that. I, I just, it drives me insane. Because you can't find that anywhere in Scripture. Anywhere. Anywhere. And so I shared that, that we have to be people who open our hearts and our lives up. We have to see other people. We have to be willing to walk through and take down the mirror and look through the window. To say, when I walk through this room, into this room, I'm not going to look for my best friend and just sit beside them and stay hugged there the whole time. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go find somebody, even if it's just one person. And even if all I do is say, hey, my name is, what's your name? That's it. And I was walking through the back doors last week. I had a man who's been here maybe two years. Um, and he shared his story in our membership class recently. He said, two years ago I came here and I was, in, I was hurt discouraged, in need of genuine relationship. He said, one of our community groups saw me and invited me. And they included me and involved me. They didn't just put me on a roster, check my name off. They invited me to be a part. He said, what you shared Sunday, that was my story. That was my story. I needed people in my life. And I'm so grateful for that group of people that said, we'll slide over and make room for you because somebody did it for me. That's what it means to people. That's what it means to step out and to see people and genuinely care for the other person, for their good. Melissa and I have led a uh, community group for years, but uh, specifically the last three or four years, for young couples, uh, young adults, young couples. And it's been so good because we get to see all the life stages happen. We get to see engagement. We get to see marriage. And then we get to see babies come along. And it's such a cool thing to watch because they're literally growing up in front of our eyes. We're not their parents, old enough to be, but we're not their parents. But it's really cool to be, like literally, um, it's so cool to watch them grow 
it, it, through life and then begin to learn to lean on Jesus and then learn to make connections and lean on each other. And, and our goal in that has been, once we kind of get them connected, we just step back. Now, we still lead, we still teach, we still host, all those things. But we kind of step back and, and make those connections and allow those relationships to flourish and to grow. And this last year, we got to see a lot, of, a lot of things happen, a lot of growth. Three specific things. You saw them start to develop this heart of, of serving, um, that they all said, I, I want to serve here, I want to serve here, I want to serve here. I know that's what I'm called to do, so I want to. And I, I don't know the number. I would say 90% of our community group is serving in some capacity consistently. And that's not because we kept pushing them, kept pushing them, kept pushing them to do that. But because as they grew in Christ and relationship with one another, they realized, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to serve other people because they have served me. They've cared for me. They've been here for me. And I want to genuinely care and serve other people as well. One of the other things that happened is that we had three uh, new couples join our group this past year at, at different times throughout the year. And when you start off, like we're doing now, and if you're not signed up for a community group, do it today, all right? Or the devil's going to get you. Um, <laughs> put you on the interstate and take you to the sign and show you. <laughs> but three couples join. And when you join at the beginning, when we kind of kick off, it's easy. But when you join throughout the year and the group's already established, it, it's hard. It's intimidating. But we had three groups, three couples join our group. And we had one night where we were all sitting around and, and they all just started sharing. We, we were talking about this intentionality of connection and, and purpose of, of being in community and engaged with one another. And one at a time, they just said, hey, we, we've never been accepted like this. We, we almost gave up. We thought we'd never find this. And they're not talking about light point, the lights, the sound. They're not talking about that. We're on a back porch. We never thought we'd find this. We've never felt so cared for and so loved. And to watch life situations happen like they do, and each other jump in and pray for and care for and be there for each other. Like watch them move each other, show up when they have babies, provide food. All the things you're supposed to do that you would expect to do. And sometimes as adults, you have a little bit more time. But as a young adult, you're still a little bit self-centered and self-focused. Not with this group, not with this, these people. They have a genuine care and heart and desire to outdo one another. Not because they want to one-up each other, but because they know it's who they are in Christ. And the third thing that happened was a, a, a practical application of that. One of our couples, the husband works um, a, a job that requires physical labor. And um, he had to have a surgery uh, on his wrist that would keep him from being able to do that for two to three months. Well, when you're raising kids, as they are, and you're out of work for a couple of months, that can be very difficult. And so one of the couples in our group started messaging everybody, hey, I want to provide for them. I want us to provide for them financially. And again, you're like, you're, you're young adults. That's awesome. I'm so glad you're going to give your $10. That will be hugely helpful. By the end, this community group of young couples raised $2,000 to give to that family who felt unbelievably blessed encouraged, strengthened. Again, I, we never thought we'd find this. We never thought we'd get to experience this. Who now has stepped out and taken a position of leading and caring for other people. And, and, and they want to, they've done that, but they felt encouraged by the group to say, I want to do this for other people too. I want them to feel what I have felt through the genuine care of this group and this body. I'll share one more with you. Um, I, I wasn't planning to, but we meet every Sunday morning, uh, about two hours before you guys get here, and we, uh, we talk about the day, we spend time praying for each other, uh, and we spend time praying for what God wants to do in our gathering. Um, and, and this one really goes with next week because it's about discipleship, but discipleship doesn't happen if you don't have community and you don't care for one another. Um, one of the young girls that uh, you see, you'll see again in a minute on stage, her name is Maisie. Um, and she's headed off to, to college. She's been in college, but she's headed off uh, this week. And we did this with another student who left uh, last year, but our worship team said, we want to pour into her. We want to care for her. 
Um, and so we got a journal. We started writing all these notes and, and things that she could look back to in Scripture that would encourage her and just, just to send her off to say, you're not going alone. You're, you're leaving your church. You're leaving your family, but you're not going alone. And so as we were talking about that and giving her that gift and praying over her, they brought up, uh, one of the guys brought up the fact that um, she's 19 now. Um, when she came here, her family came here, she was eight years old. And she was in the kids' ministry. And so you talk about watching people grow up like, literally in front of your eyes. She was in the kids' ministry. And the lady that was leading kids' worship that day was Victoria, who's standing next to her worship, leading worship today. And so at eight years old, Maisie shows up over there, and she jumps on stage with Victoria and jumps up there to sing with her as she's leading, now full circle 11 years later because of that serving, caring, authenticity, genuineness. It gave Maisie the desire and courage and model to say, I want to do that. God's gifted me. I want to serve the body. I want to care for people. And now they're standing up here as two adults serving and worshiping and leading and caring together. That's what it does. That's what it does. Jesus seems to say, and I won't put words in his mouth, but Jesus and Paul literally say that the care of the body by one another is more important than the words the pastor says or the songs the congregation sings. Because he says, when you do those good works, they will praise my Father in heaven. And all the law is fulfilled and hangs on this one thing, that you love one another. Paul says, look, I could speak with the tongue of men and angels, but if I don't have love, if I don't genuinely care, it doesn't matter. My words mean nothing. That's what Paul calls on the Galatian church in, in chapter 6. He said, we're to bear one another's burden. That's what caring is, that I see your hurt, I see your need, I see your pain, and I'm going to stand there with you and carry that with you. And that fulfills the law of Christ, that what you do for one another is more important than anything I could ever say. That does not discount the word of God. That is not stripping the, the power from the word of God or the Holy Spirit. But if we say the right things from stage and we don't love each other practically, Paul says it's worthless. So how we care for one another, how we live and care and love each other spreads the gospel more than just about anything else you could ever do. And so my question and encouragement for you is what about you? How are you allowing God to use you to care for this body? How, how are you using your resources, your gifts, your abilities? How are you using that? Even if it's just one other person, how are you using that to love and to care for? Because you never know when you do that it might just soften and change that person's heart. And it might just change yours as well. Let us be that people. All right, let's pray. Father, I, I pray like Paul, uh, even for myself, uh, that you would just continue to grow a love and a care and a passion and desire for one another. That it's so easy to drift into isolation. It's so easy to say, well, I've done that. I did my time. Somebody else should. But God, our, our care and service of one another, not in a position or role, speaks to our heart and changes our heart. And so, God, soften us, encourage us, give us the power, confidence, and ability to step into just walking across the room, taking a meal, inviting somebody over. Help us to see people. As Paul said, not with physical eyes, but with spiritual eyes. Help us to fulfill the law of Christ that we would love, genuinely love and care for one another. We want to be your people, and we need your spirit to change us to be like you. So we ask you to help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.